Okay, I want to start today with a demonstration that um, I think it would work better if you tried it at home. But uh, what I have are two glasses that have pennies in the bottom. And you can kind of see that glass. And they're pretty much identical glasses. But one of them I filled with water. And I want to tip this on its side to show you because uh, I would have dumped out all the water. Anyway, if you do this at home, um, sometimes it works better if you have something taller than just a glass like this. Like if you could have it, some object that's, if you have two identical objects that are each about as far as it is between my hands right now, like 17 inches high or something. And if you can put, say, 10 inches of water in it, in one of them, and then drop a penny in, you'll be able to see this easier. It's not showing up through the camera, but if you just actually, if I just take these things and look down them, try to get that. Oh, I just spilled water. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I can live with that sort of. Start, get some new water. But if you uh, look down them, you can see with your eye that the object, the penny that's in the one that has water in it, appears to be closer to your eye. And your eye will have to focus at a closer distance for this one than it does at this one. And it's noticeably different. Uh, water doesn't have all that high an index of refraction. It's 1.33. But if you could uh, do something with, say, corn oil or uh, canola oil or something like that in one of the glasses, that's got a higher index of refraction and it'll be a more noticeable effect. So um, give that a shot. It's just kind of a fun little experiment to do at home. And I need to get some new paper down here somehow. Well, let's see. <laughs> okay, it's soaked through those two. Maybe these will still be usable. Okay, and today I'm going to remember to click here so those weird little things on the side disappear on us. All right, today we're looking at refracting surfaces, which is what you just saw on this thing. And for this, I'm going to sketch the situation that they've developed in the textbook, and then I'll write down the, the formulas that they've done. And we'll just imagine that here's some kind of optical axis for something. And we'll have a medium A on this side and a medium B on this side. Medium A is going to have an index of refraction N sub A. Medium B will have an index of refraction N sub B. And so refraction will take place as you go from one medium into the other. And then we'll put an object over here, medium A. So this will be our object. And the object distance is the S with no prime on it. And so that'll be the distance from the interface between A and B to the object. And then an image might form of object A, and it might be inverted, it might not, it depends. But anyway, this will be the image. And we'll actually look at some situations where the image of the object is still over here, like the penny in the jar in the glass. Actually, that was the case. But uh, this will be the image, and the distance to the image will be S prime. And they go through a derivation in the textbook, monkeying around with uh, some geometry. You have to know your some trigonometric or geometry things for angles and triangles and and stuff like that. A little bit of trigonometry, right angle trigonometry. They use the tangent function, and they also use something called the small angle approximation. And what it is is like this: if an angle theta is much less than one, and that's the way I would denote being much less than one, 
then the sine of theta is about equal to theta. And the smaller it is, the closer you get. If you get a small enough angle, the sine of theta will equal theta. This has to be in radians, by the way, but it'll equal theta out to three or four significant figures. So that's usually enough. And also the same is true of the tangent of theta, that it'll be about equal to theta. And so those are some of the things that the uh, derivation of the, the formula that they use depends on. And when they do it, you end up with this particular formula that n sub a over s plus n sub b over s is going to equal n sub b minus n sub a divided by the radius of curvature of that thing. And then for refracting surfaces, these are our sign conventions for refracting surfaces. Um, and first of all, they talk about what the front is and what the back is. The front is the side from which the light approaches the surface. So in this case, the object is on this side. The light will have to leave the object to form an image of it. And so this is the, the front in this case, the side from which the light approaches the surface. And then the back is the side that the light travels to after refraction. And this is probably about the trickiest place as far as uh, determining the front and the back and then the radii of curvature. It's kind of tricky. So the S is positive if the object is in front of the surface. I don't think on this section we'll have any virtual objects, so we won't worry about that one. S prime is positive if the image is in back of the surface, that's on the side the light travels to after refraction, and it's negative if the image is in front of the surface, that's a virtual image. The image of the penny in the glass of water that I showed at the start here, that would be a virtual image for that penny. And we'll do an example involving that. And then the radius of curvature, it's positive if the center of curvature is in back of the surface. So in this case, here's the object, the image. This is front on this side because it's the, the side from which the light approaches the surface. This is the back. And the radius of curvature is positive if the center of curvature is in back of the surface. So the sketch that I made here would have a positive radius of curvature. So those are things that we'll have to keep track of. And I have to be really careful when I do these problems because I've mixed them up before, um, put a wrong sign on the radius of curvature and I'll get to a certain point and I think, a sec, that doesn't make sense. And I'll have to back up and look real carefully at my, my assumptions for the things. So let's try doing a problem with that. We might be able to, uh, these problems may not take a long time, and we may be able to introduce the thin, some of the thin lens equations here today, and uh, we'll be monkeying around with some of these tomorrow in lab. So we'll see how that goes. So this time, a colored marble is dropped into a large tank filled with benzene, which has an index of refraction of 1.50 and would smell to the high heavens. Um, what's the depth of the tank if the apparent depth of the marble, when viewed from directly above the tank, is 35 centimeters? So this is a situation where um, presumably we have air that's up here, and we have benzene down here, and... We've got a marble that's been dropped into this tank, and it's sitting right down here. So there's the marble. This isn't to scale, of course, uh, but the apparent um, depth of the marble is going to be 35 centimeters. Now, we've got n equals...
1.50 here n equals 1.00 up here, and I'm just writing it to three significant figures, although you could tag on a couple of other zeros for the index of refraction of air, or one other one anyway. But uh, so there's the situation, and let's see how we might apply the uh, the equation we developed here. This is medium A. It's in the way the thing was developed. Medium A is over here. Medium B is over here. So we have that. And so the object is in medium A. And so I'll call this N sub A. This is N sub B, just the 1.00. Okay, well, let's look at what happens with this thing as far as we've got. We'll have N sub A over S plus N sub B over S prime is going to equal, in this case, it'll, well, it's always N sub B minus N sub A over R. But if you've got a flat surface, the radius of curvature is infinite. So this term just vanishes, and that's equal to zero. And so we can... Now, S is going to be the distance from the surface down here to the marble. And I drew way too big a marble, probably. I don't know. Marble might be at most maybe a centimeter in diameter. And uh, so it's not going to be much compared to the 35 centimeters that we've got. The depth is actually going to be even more than that. So we'll have N sub B as 1. S prime is going to be 35.0 centimeters. Now, what about the sign on that? The S prime in magnitude is 35.0 centimeters, but it's a virtual object. It'll be some point that's up here, like the penny in the glass, and it's not, the light doesn't actually diverge from this point, but it appears to. And that's what a virtual object is. And so in this case, I'll have uh, S prime is a negative number. And N sub A is the 1.50. And S is going to be the depth. So... 1.50 over the depth of that liquid. Um, actually, I just could have, yeah, let's just call it the depth. Plus N sub B. Um, N sub B is one, it's air. So 1.00, and I should have put a minus sign out there. I've got a minus 35.0 centimeters here. And that's equal to zero. So I can just kick this across and say 1.50 over D is going to equal 1.00 over 35.0 centimeters. And I can flip both sides. Simple fraction equals simple fraction. So D over 1.50 is going to equal just 35.0 centimeters over one, but that's just 35 centimeters. So the depth is going to be 1.50 times 35.0, which I think is, let's see, 17 and a half, 52.5. Check that. Um, yeah, 52.5 centimeters is the actual depth of the thing. And so if uh, you do the experiment with the glasses, the two glasses, and have it filled to the top with oil, which has an index of refraction of about 1.5, the apparent depth of the penny will only be about two thirds of the depth of the glass. And that should be very noticeable. The scale of the glass you can get um, let's see, in chemistry, they've got those 
graduated cylinders that are real skinny and fairly tall, um, but you probably can't do that just in the lab. Although if you ask nicely, maybe they'd let you do it. Anyway, there's our first problem. And uh, a infinite radius of curvature, that's a new thing for us. But that's something that happens when you've got flat surfaces. Okay, now we'll do something that's curved here. A glass sphere of radius 15 centimeters, which is pretty good size. <laughs> 15 centimeters is that big. That means the diameter is going to be 30 centimeters. So this is a great big glass sphere. And it has a tiny air bubble 5 centimeters from the center. Oh, where's my circle drawing thing? I haven't seen it for a few days. Who knows where I put it? Anyway, we'll just draw it, but uh, okay, there's our glass sphere. It's got a radius and the sphere is viewed along the radius containing the bubble. So let's just suppose out here, we've got somebody looking at this thing. some enterprising engineering physics student staring at it. Uh, let's see. A third of the way out along there, we've got a bubble. So if it's a third of the way from the center, it's going to be 10 centimeters from there. And that would be the object in this case. So that's S. And what's the apparent depth below the surface of the sphere for that bubble? Well, let's go ahead and uh, look at our equation in this case and be really careful about how we choose the signs. So the equation is, this is going to be A. So N sub A, it's got an index of refraction of 1.50. And... That's the medium that the thing is in. This will be N sub B out here, which is going to be air again. And our formula looks like this. N sub A over S plus N sub B over S prime is going to equal N sub B minus n sub a divided by the radius of curvature. Okay, now we can assign numbers to these things. n sub a is 1.50, the index refraction of glass. Uh, let's see, we know s is equal to, if it's five centimeters from the surface or from the center, if it's got a 15 centimeter radius, it's going to be 10.0 centimeters. So S is 10.0 centimeters. So we know that. Um, what about the radius of curvature? Okay. Take a look at this. Uh, sign conventions for refracting surfaces. Now, remember, let's see, this is the front. That's the side that the light approaches the interface from. This is the back. That's the side that the light travels to after refraction. And R is positive if the center of curvature is in back of the surface. It would be positive if it's over here, but it's not. R isn't the center of curvature isn't over there. It's right here. So it's in front of the surface. So R is negative if the center of curvature is in front of the surface. So the radius that we've got here is going to be minus 15.0. So now we can plug all our numbers in here and see what comes out of this. Let's see, N sub A is 1.50. And 
S is 10.0 centimeters. Plus N sub B, 1.00 over S prime. And that will equal N sub B minus N sub A, which is going to be 1.00 minus 1.50. Index is a refraction or dimensionless. So it's actually, they're actually a ratio of the speed of light in the medium to the speed of light in vacuum or vice versa, speed of light in vacuum over the speed of light in the medium. And then R is negative 15.0 centimeters. So let's see what we can do with this. I'll have 1.00 over S prime is gonna equal, this all ends up being positive. I'd have minus one or minus 0 0.50 over minus 15.0, which is positive. So 0 0.50 over 15.0 centimeters. Uh, let's see, minus 1.50 over 10 centimeters, 10.0 meters. And I could just figure this out. Um, that's 10.0. Yeah, I can write a, this as a simple fraction. If you uh, get a common denominator, multiply top and bottom here by 10 centimeters. On the bottom, I'll have 10 centimeters times 15 centimeters, which is 150 three sig fig squared. Let's see, and 10 times that is going to be 5.0, only two sig figs. Minus, this is going to be 15 times 1.5, which is minus 22.5 centimeters. Okay, and the uncertainty remains in the tenths place. This would actually be minus 17.5 up here. So 1.00 over S prime. 1.00 over S prime is going to equal 150 centimeters squared. This is just arithmetic at this point. And a negative 17.5 centimeters there. So S prime. Simple fraction equals simple fraction. Flip them both. S prime will end up equaling 150. It's going to be negative. That tells me that it's going to be on this side. Boy, sure helps if you turn on the calculator first. <sighs> Let's see. Okay, anyway, I get a minus 11.7 um, centimeters. I hope I did that right. Did I make any mistakes on there? 10 times that, 50 times that. That should be right. Yeah minus 11.7 centimeters, although, let's see. I think I got a different side, or something was different when I did this before, but uh, might check that one. Let's see. Oh, negative on that out the units in B one minus one point five zero yeah when I did it before I tried to be really fancy solving for a whole bunch of the stuff but uh yeah 
at any rate, that's what we get. So, oh, I don't have my comments on or the chat, so I should do that in case anybody has any. I haven't seen any questions. All right. Well, that was kind of an odd one, too. So one more of these. This time we has, have a glass hemisphere used as a paperweight with its flat face resting on a stack of papers. The radius of the circular cross section is 4.00 centimeters. That's for the hemisphere. And the index of refraction of glass is 1.55. Okay. The center of the hemisphere is directly over the letter, a letter O that is two and a half millimeters in diameter. What is the diameter of the image as seen from above along a vertical radius? So here's our situation. We've got a stack of paper here. We have a glass hemisphere here, which has a radius of 4.00 centimeters. And this time somebody's down at this thing. And we want to know what is the diameter of the edge of the letter. Okay, the letter itself is two and a half millimeters in diameter. Well, we need to do a little bit of figuring here. And I'm going to start by Let's see, there's a sheet of paper I can write on. Thinking of the papers under here, the glass is up here. And so let's see what happens if I use my uh, refraction formula that we're using here for Na over S plus Nb over S prime is going to equal Nb minus Na over R. Actually, I don't get anything very useful out of here. Um, I've got an infinite radius of curvature, which is one thing that's going to, um, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, going from the air that this piece of paper is in into the glass here. And I've got a flat thing. And I would expect that the image of that O in that case is just going to be at the bottom of the piece of glass. It's a flat piece of glass. So this thing's going to be infinite. And so that makes this side of the equation zero. And S prime, let's see, N sub B, which is going to be that of the gas for starters, is going to equal the negative of N sub A over S. And let's see, I'll flip both of these because if I plug in the zero too soon, it's not going to work. S prime over N sub B is going to equal minus N sub A over, whoops, minus, excuse me, minus S over N sub A. And what'll happen here? S prime is going to equal minus N sub B over N sub A times S but S is equal to zero, that means S prime is going to be zero as well. So that's where the image of the O, it's just going to appear to be there at the bottom. Um, otherwise, we might have had to, to deal with something more complicated. But now we can just pretend there's an O that's got a diameter of 2.5 millimeters right at the bottom of this piece of glass. And this one will tell you why these things work as magnifiers. I've got a hemispherical one. It's not made out of glass. It's made out of uh, plexiglass, which would have a different index refraction. But it works. You can set it on things, and it blows stuff up. So let's see what we've got. First of all, we've got a radius of curvature that's 4.00 centimeters. Now, this is going to be the front 
this medium here, okay, and the index of that is 1.55. This is the back. And go back to my formula sheet here. I hope you've printed this and are starting to get familiar with it. The radius of curvature, if the center of curvature is in back of the surface, that is on the side the light travels to after refraction. It's negative if the center of curvature is in front of the surface. Well, this center of curvature is in front of the surface. Here's the back. This seems weird. Okay, but that's just the way the things are defined. So we actually have a negative radius of curvature in this case. Um, first thing we'll do is figure out where does the image of that O show up. And so this would be N sub A. This is N sub B. Uh, a is the side it starts from and B is the side the light ends up on. So we can go ahead and write our formula yet again, uh, N sub A over S plus N sub B over S prime is going to be N sub B minus N sub A over R again. And uh, the N sub A, or the S, is going to be the four centimeters. That's the actual distance from this surface to where the O is. So S equals 4.00 centimeters. We don't know where S prime is going to be. That's the big mystery. But we can kick this thing across. N sub B over S prime will equal N sub A, oops, the negative of N sub A over S, plus N sub B minus N sub A over R. So I can plug numbers in for everything on this side. N sub B is 1. So I'd have 1.00 over S prime is going to equal minus N sub A, that's the 1.55, divided by S, which is the 4.00 centimeters, plus N sub B out here, the index of refraction is 1 because it's air, so I have 1.00 minus 1.55, and I'm dividing by the radius, which is negative, so minus 4.00 centimeters. Uh, this all looks like minus 1.55 over 4.00 centimeters, plus it's actually 0.55 over Oh, got a common denominator for a change. Good. Okay, so 1.00 over S prime will equal, uh, let's see, minus 1.55, minus 1.00 over 4.00 centimeters. Flip both of those and I get S prime over 1.00, which is just S prime, is going to be minus 4.00 centimeters, which bothers me. Um, does that seem correct? Maybe. Um, anyway, it's a virtual image. That's what the negative number means. And it'll still appear to be that far away. But we haven't figured out the magnification yet. And um, I don't know if I gave the formula for that or not. Uh, I may not have. Did I have it? Where did I write that down? Um, yeah, the magnification in this situation is kind of weird, the way it shows up. 
I think that's it. Um, <laughs> I wrote it on the back of one of these problems. Oh, here it is. Um, the magnification in this case, and this is something that they develop in that uh, formula, is minus n sub a f prime over n sub b s. And in this case, well, we've got all the numbers. n sub a is the 1.55. S prime was minus 4.00 centimeters. And uh, on the bottom, N sub B is 1.00. And we multiply that by plus 4.00 centimeters. And everything divides out. We'll have a minus and a minus makes it plus. We'll end up with a magnification in this case of 1.55. So the magnification ends up equaling just the index of refraction of this glass hemisphere, or a number equal to that in magnitude anyway. Well, if the O that the thing is sitting over is two and a half millimeters in diameter, the height of the image is going to equal m times the height of the object. So it's going to be 1.55 times 2.5 millimeters. But you get a magnification of one and a half. That's not bad. Um, a lot of times, if it's fine print, bumping it up by that much makes it a whole lot easier to read. And I get about 3.9. We've only got two sig figs here. So 3.9 millimeters. So we got something out of that. Okay. Um, there's a few refracting surfaces ones. I think what I'd like to do now is introduce a couple of uh, thin lens equations. And they don't exactly derive these completely in the textbook, but um, we'll just sort of accept them and uh, see what we can get out of these. So thin lens equations. I don't think I even gave you a homework problem on a refracting surface. Maybe I did, but... Uh, Okay, so thin lens equation, we actually have seen some of these before. We've got, uh, this is one, one over S plus one over S prime equals one over F. Well, that equation works for mirrors too. So that's kind of nice. Um, now we don't have a radius of curvature showing up yet because when you've got a thin lens, you have two surfaces which might have different radii of curvature they're certainly going to have different centers for their centers of curvature. For instance, if you've got um, a lens like this and the light is approaching it from this side, the first surface it hits is going to have its center of curvature over here. And then it enters at the medium. And then it encounters this second center of curvature which might have, well, it'll have its center over here. This is for a, a convex, convex lens, but this would be R2. And R2 doesn't have to equal R1 in magnitude. They're going to have different signs for sure because one center of curvature is going to be maybe on the positive or negative side and the other one's on the positive or negative side. So we'll have to, to sweat that stuff out. Um, Something you'll have, the magnification, I think we use this with mirrored images as well. We'll have minus S prime over S is one thing. And then there's a third equation, which is the lens makers formula. They do derive this, I think. Um, lens makers. And I can't remember if they call it the lens makers formula or equation. 
probably equation. But it's this, one over F is equal to N minus one. Now, this is the index of refraction of the material that the lens is made from. The one that shows up in here is the index of refraction of the air that surrounds it. If you had a different medium surrounding the lens, you'd have to replace that one with whatever the index of refraction of that medium happens to be. There's a homework question about that. So anyway, you, and then you'd have one over R1 minus one over R2, where R1 is the radius of curvature of the um, surface that the light first encounters. And then R2 is the radius of curvature of the surface that the light encounters as it's leaving the lens. So that's the lens maker's equation. If you were trying to make a lens with a particular radius of curvature, a lot of times you'll want to match the things. You want to have R1 be equal to R2. It's just easier to manufacture the lens that way. Although not necessarily, if you're putting them into a mold and pouring molten glass into it, you might do it differently. But if you are grinding it, it might be easiest to have the two be equal. But uh, you'd know what the index of refraction of the material was that you were making it out of. And you'd have to grind the, the surfaces to particular radii of curvature. And so you'd have to worry about this. We're going to do a lab, not this week, but next week, where we'll determine the uh, indices of refraction experimentally by using this equation. And we'll do a series of measurements with each lens and get a uh, bunch of S and S prime values. We'll actually graph, make a graph, which is, this is the weirdest graph you'll ever see, but it'll end up looking like that. And we'll have one over S on the vertical axis, or maybe one over S prime and one over S prime on the horizontal. I can't remember exactly which order I have you do, but what will be after in that case are the intercepts. So we're not going to carry a, care about the slope this time, although we do want to, we'll uh, put these in Excel and use the, uh, the linear, get the linear equation of this, and then we can figure out exactly what the intercepts are going to be, each of the two intercepts. And that's, uh, turns out, each of these intercepts will be the reciprocal of the focal length. So it'll be a an odd graph. But anyway, that's the, those are the equations that are going to de define our uh, thin lens problems. And I forgot to figure these out or print off an example problem, but I'll just make one up. Um, a thin lens has a focal length. Of, and we'll just make up one. 45.0 centimeters. Okay. A small object is placed sixty five point zero centimeters from the lens. So we'll have a group of questions here, and I may just make up another lens after this one and, and see where it is. Um, and I'm going to put a plus sign on this. It's got a positive focal length. Okay, well, let's see. If I go back to my sign conventions here, this time it's sign conventions for thin lenses. 
Um, it's got the same definition for front and back. The front is the side from which the light approaches the surface. The back is the side that light travels to after refraction. Uh, R1 is the radius of curvature of the front surface, R2 the radius of curvature of the back. The focal length is positive for a converging lens and it's negative for a diverging lens. Well, good grief, how are we supposed to figure that out? Well, I said it was positive. Actually, here's what a converging lens looks like. Okay, converging lens. Looks like a magnifying glass lens. It's fatter in the middle and it is at the edges. Here's what a diverging lens looks like. It's skinny in the middle and wider on the edges. My glasses happen to have diverging lenses. That's the case for people who are nearsighted. And uh, I've been wearing glasses since I was in fifth grade. I wore contact lenses for about 13 years, but uh, they started bothering my eyes after a while. But um, anyway, used to be the edges of my glasses were really thick. And that was back when the style of glasses was to have great big lenses on them uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And they were thin in the middle, but that the farther you got from the middle, the fatter it got. And then they started making glasses out of what they called high index of refraction materials. And uh, they didn't have to have such fat edges anymore. You could get the same focal length with um, thinner pieces of glass. And, and then glasses started having the style where the lenses were smaller, which is kind of nice. You don't need those great big lenses because you're not usually looking out the side of the lenses. You're usually just looking through this part of it. So trim it way down and it doesn't have to be so thick. Okay, well, let's go ahead and finish this problem. If it's a converging lens, it's got a positive focal length. And what we have here is whoops, missed, that's supposed to go through the center. Anyway, we've got an object over here, and I usually just draw arrows for the objects. It's 65.0 centimeters away, so S equals 65.0 centimeters. And our equation for figuring out where the image is, oh, question A, where is the image? So that'll be A. B will be, is the image right side up or inverted? Or maybe I'll ask next, what is the magnification? And C. real or virtual image. Okay, now in this case, what that's gonna mean is, if it's a real image, does the light actually converge to a point and that's where you see the image or does the light appear to diverge from a point and that's where you see the image. So if the light actually converges to a point, that'll make it a real image. If it, if you can't see, if the light doesn't actually converge to a point, but it appears to diverge from a point, that'll make it a virtual image. So we'll have some situations where we have virtual images. In fact, it'll be easy in this case to get one if you make the uh, object distance, put the object inside the focal length of the lens. That's the trick. So we'll see what happens here. Anyway, where's the image? Well, we've got one over S 
plus one over S prime equals one over F. I'm gonna go through the work and just solve for where S prime is before I plug in numbers. So one over S prime equals, we did this last week, one over F minus one over S, which is gonna be S minus F over FS. And I know that because I've done this process so many times, but you should work through the little bit of arithmetic of getting this thing. Anyway, S prime is going to equal Fs over S minus F, which is going to be 45 centimeters times 65.0 centimeters. Oh, let's see. Have I got the right signs? I told myself or told you that it had a positive focal length. S is positive if the object is in front of the lens. In this case, this would be the front. Well, the front is the side that the light approaches the lens from. So the light that's coming off of our object here has to travel in this direction to get to the lens. And so this is the front side. And this is the back side, but we've got a positive S value here. So anyway, and then down here we'll have 65.0 centimeters minus 45.0 centimeters. And that's just arithmetic now. S prime will be uh, 45 times 65 divided by 20. And I get 146 centimeters. So that image, it's positive. Okay, it came out positive, And that's because I've got a positive number in the denominator where I have the subtraction. But it's going to be way the heck off here to the right. So that's that. What about the magnification? Well, the magnification is always minus s prime over s, which is going to be minus 146 centimeters over 65.0 centimeters, or two point two five 2.25. The minus sign tells me that the image is inverted. So that's what tells me that's the case. Is it a real or a virtual image? Well, I got a positive value for the image distance. That means it's a real image. And what's going to happen is the light or the, the image of this object over here is going to show up on the far side. It's going to be upside down. Two and a or two and a quarter times as big as the object itself, and but it'll be way over here somewhere relative to that. So all of those things that I can figure out using my equations for these things. So let's take the same lens and uh, change the problem a little bit. So start off with. F equals plus is 45.0 centimeters. Oh, um, if you had this thing lit up so it was fairly light and you had this 65 centimeters away, if you put a card over on this side of the lens, uh, let's see, 146 centimeters away from the lens, you'd get a sharp image, whatever the object happened to be, showing up on that card. If you had it closer, the image would be blurry. If you had it farther away, the image would be blurry. But at that distance, 146 centimeters, you'd get a nice sharp image of it. And one of the first things I'll show you tomorrow, at least if it's still in the classroom, I haven't taught optics live in there for, ah, wow, five years because last time I got to do it was 2019. But if it's still set up, I could set it up anyway. Um, I had a card that I had taped a penny onto, and I would light it up real brightly. 
and then we can form an image uh, with a lens on a card and you can see how that'll work out. But let's go ahead and have that. This time we'll have the object is only 25.0 centimeters from the lens. So here's our lens. Okay, the focal point, which is the distance from the lens to the, um, well, one focal length distance away from the lens. So this is F. This is going to be plus 45.0 centimeters. The object this time, we're sticking here at 25.0 centimeters. So here's the front. That's the side the light approaches the lens from before it's refracted. Here's the back. And we've got the observer over here somehow. Didn't draw a very good eyeball this time, but that's okay anyway. Wow, that's maybe the worst one I've ever done. There, that looks a little bit. I just put that one part. That looks like some giant octopus eye or something. I don't know. Anyway, how is how are things going to work out this time? Well, we know S, we know F, we can figure out S prime. Let's see. I'll go ahead and write out that derivation again. 1 over S prime plus 1 over S. Sometimes they're written in the opposite order, but this operation is commutative, so it doesn't matter. Equals 1 over F. 1 over S prime equals 1 over F minus 1 over S, which is S minus F over FS. So S prime is going to equal uh, FS over S minus F, which in this case is going to be 45.0 centimeters times 25.0 centimeters, just like last time divided by S minus F, that's going to be 25.0 minus 45.0. That's negative 20.0 centimeters. Hmm. Okay, well, let's see where S prime happens to be. It's minus 56.3 centimeters. Yeah, I'll have three significant figures there. Now, that negative sign means that it's actually going to be back over here somewhere. In fact, the image is actually going to be, this is the object. Here's the image. Oh, let's see what the magnification is so I know which way to draw it. Magnification is minus S prime over S. Well, that's minus negative 56.3 centimeters over 25.0 centimeters. So well, minus and minus makes it a plus. The image is going to be upright and whatever 56.3 divided by 25 is, Two and a quarter again, but it's positive, which means over here, we're going to have an object that's two and a quarter times, or an image that's two and a quarter times as big as the object, and it's on that side. Minus sign tells me that it's a virtual image, and you can see what that means here. The light does not actually diverge from this point. Okay, As the light from this thing goes through the, the lens, it's actually, well, it's going to go through this lens. But on this side, it looks as though the object is way over here. And that's the image that you're looking at. It just looks like that far away but it's two and a quarter, 2.25 times as big as the object. So it's magnified. And uh, this would be using this lens like a magnifying glass. And actually, that's 
what a magnifying glass, how it works. To see things through a magnifying glass, you get, you hold the magnifying glass and you get it closer to the object than the focal length happens to be. And you get a magnified image that way. So, okay. Um, that's a little bit of an introduction to that. We'll do more problems like this. We might do some more tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, I've got a bunch of different light demonstrations that I want to show you. There's one thing, I don't know if I've got it handy here or not. Um, yes, I do. This is something that uh, a friend of mine gave me, and I'll pass this around in the class tomorrow. There's a a gadget that when you're using a telescope, you can put it on the telescope and uh, like, here's your big telescope here. And it's a something called a reflex finder. And the particular one that he made this for is a little thing. It's just a, a rectangular thing. But if you look at it, it's got a, a sloping mirror on it. And when you're using this thing, you actually um, look at it from this side. So you're looking in this direction and you're looking along the axis of the telescope and you're at, you can actually see things that are, see stars and stuff like that, that are, you see it through this piece of glass, but there's also a little bullseye that's projected onto this thing from a little light source that's down here. And it's kind of neat, except if you're looking at something that's just about straight up, you have to be, you have to be looking along the axis of the telescope for this thing. And so here you've got this little finder and you have to be looking up in that direction. You have to stick your head down here near the bottom of the telescope. And it's kind of tough on the neck. Or you might have to get down on your knees and look up at the thing. And it's not the best. However, this thing that my friend basically invented, I don't know if he'd read about one of these or not, but it's got a prism in here that's called a pentaprism. And... Um, when you're using it, you actually look into this hole and you can, this thing will be attached to that little gadget. And you can, when you're looking at something like this, here's the gadget that he made. You can be looking into this from the side and you'll see the bullseye that's projected for this thing and use it as a finder. And the nice thing about this is the way it's designed is that it gives you a correct left, right, and upright image of whatever the thing is aimed at. So you don't have to do any weird flipping of dimensions that you sometimes have to do with telescope finder scopes. And I'll, I'll pass this around tomorrow so you can see how it works. You can just take it and hold it like this and aim it at different places in the room and uh, see how they appear upright. It's kind of neat. like. Right now, I've got a coffee cup here with a Powell's Bookstore logo on it. And when I look at it through there, the, everything is upright, no reversed images or anything. So that's part of what we'll see tomorrow. Okay, I'll um, stop here, stop the recording first, I guess. And I didn't see any questions show up. So I'll see you tomorrow at 2.15.